climate change has received publicity for decades already. We have known for a long time, but there has not been a reasonable response by governments, corporations, and individuals. There is no scientific contest to whether or not global warming is real. It is a scientific fact. In a survey of almost 1,000 scientific articles published in peer-reviewed journals in the last 50 years, zero were found doubting that the cause of recent warming has been caused by human greenhouse gas release into the atmosphere, and that its implications are serious. Despite this, over the last 20 years, in around half of the articles of the popular press, so-called reporters have contested that the cause is ambiguous and that it may not be a problem. Favored by various industries, lobby groups, and world governments, such misinformation has undeniably caused damage to exasperating the situation, holding back the much-needed initiatives in the past. While we have seen that there are aspects of climate change that are still uncertain, given its complexity, as illustrated in the series, in recent years there have already been an increased abundance of droughts, hurricanes, and floods most of which scientists correlate to the human-induced warming. Temperature records have been broken year to year throughout the globe, and natural disaster magnitudes also. In this series, we have observed the various predictions and models, showing many more such devastating effects to come, given the temperature rise. This can largely affect the ocean, part of the hydrosphere, a major player in the climate system. So, what is the hydrosphere? Well, so far in this series, we have explained how the spheres of the climate system, the atmosphere, the cryosphere, and the biosphere, work together in a delicate and intricate balance. The hydrosphere is part of it in the same way, and includes everything ranging from oceans to puddles. The oceans make up 99% of the liquid water found on our planet, whereas lakes, rivers, and groundwater combined only make up a mere 1%. However, the latter terrestrial-bound constituents do play a vital role in controlling land moisture, precipitation cycles, and supplying the oceans with nutrients. The water in oceans moves much more slowly than the air in the atmosphere, but water can store more heat due to its higher heat capacity, typically four times that of air. Therefore, unlike the changing atmosphere, the oceans reflect little change in their temperature from other sources. This is because of the thermal inertia of the hydrosphere and the sheer amount of water available on the Earth's surface, 70%. In fact, any temperature changes that happen over a period of under six years will have little to no permanent effects on the ocean temperature. Ocean surface currents are generated by prevailing winds that blow across the sea. They are influenced by the rotation of the Earth, much like atmospheric circulation. However, unlike winds, the currents cannot cross the land. Ocean currents can transport heat very effectively where atmospheric winds interact with the ocean surfaces, moving the heat around in large-scale circulation patterns. Cold currents originate from around the poles, and warm currents dominate the horizontal wastes of the Earth, around the equatorial regions. Just as in the atmosphere, larger current belts transport heat from the equatorial regions to the poles, mainly as part of a large conveyor belt. For example, water arriving to the North Atlantic Ocean cools and becomes more salty, because at these high latitudes, less fresh water enters from rivers. This salt concentration sinks deeper at a very rapid rate, because it is denser. And as it is pulled southward, it gives way to the incoming warm, shallower current from the equatorial regions. Also, as the water descends, it takes CO2 with it, which has been effectively dissolved at the surface. In fact, the North Atlantic is a considerable and long-term CO2 sink. On a global scale, this heat and salt conveyor belt is known as thermohaline circulation, and any changes in its pattern can strongly influence the global climate. In the North Atlantic, the conveyor relies on cooling the water enough and making it dense enough. This can be disrupted if the water becomes too warm, as a result of atmospheric warming, or if more sweet water from rivers comes in, diluting the salty, dense water. For example, if the runoff from Siberian streams that go into the Arctic Ocean would be increased, from glacier or permafrost melting, then this addition of sweet water could disrupt the conveyor. At the end of the last ice age, as the ice in North America melted, a large pool of fresh water formed. It eventually broke out into the ocean, shutting off the conveyor, stopping heat transfer from the Gulf Stream to Europe, forcing it into another ice age. Today, if this conveyor belt were to shut down, then the land around the North Atlantic would be cooler by about 6 degrees. And the ice sheet 
of Greenland could easily contribute in much the same way as it is in a similar position. In addition to water, oceans consist of many life forms that balance out the chemicals in the atmosphere and the ocean. For example, photosynthetic organisms, such as microbes and algae, in the hydrosphere remove carbon from the atmosphere, and when they die, they settle as organic debris on the ocean floor. Part becomes sediment, and part are eaten by microbes, where during respiration, the microbes combine the carbon they've ingested into either CO2 or methane. In the depths, the methane settles in the pores of sediments, where at the low temperatures and high pressures at the ocean floor, it combines with water to be stored as a frozen solid. This is now methane hydrate, essentially methane molecules trapped in the crystalline structure of ice. These also form in the permafrost residues of the cryosphere. Despite being assessed as a potential fuel for the future, methane hydrates can also have detrimental effects when destabilized. They are highly susceptible to small changes in temperature and can rapidly transform to gas. An increase in ocean floor sediment or polar permafrost temperatures would release the methane, a powerful greenhouse gas more potent than CO2, from its hydrate cage. Evidence suggests that around 60 million years ago, ocean temperatures increased by around 6 degrees, which thawed a lot of the frozen methane, releasing it into the atmosphere. The increased abundance of methane led to more heating, both because it is a greenhouse gas and because it reacted with oxygen to make CO2, which in turn released even more methane, and so on. The process snowballed. This effect carried on to cause forest fires and the like, leading to devastating extinctions. In today's world, there are around half a trillion tons of methane hydrate in permafrost in northern Canada, and around 10 to 20 trillion tons trapped in deep sea sediments. Note that in the scenario above, it only took 2 trillion tons released over 10,000 years. Potentially, the release can be very rapid, especially in response to rapid temperature changes. And the recent warming we've experienced on the planet can definitely be described as rapid, especially in geologic time. <laughs>